Hello everyone. My name is Satya Narayan. In this session, we are going to take a look at one of the most important parts of English grammar and those are the parts of speech. Now, if you remember our basic lessons from our school days, can you recall how many parts of speech are there? Well, just to list them out for you, we talk about nouns, pronouns and adjectives. Then we have our verbs and our adverbs. And finally, we talk about the prepositions, the conjunctions and the interjections. So, in all, there are eight different parts of speech. The nouns, pronouns and adjectives are those parts of speech which have to do with labeling objects. Verbs and adverbs are concerned with the actions that we perform. And prepositions, conjunctions and interjections are the small things which hold an entire sentence together. Well, a noun is a naming word. It names a person, place, thing, an idea, a living creature, a quality or an action. For example, words such as man, mall, chair, flower, honesty are all different examples for nouns. If you go to take a look at the types of nouns, some of the basic types are the proper noun, the common noun, the collective noun and the abstract noun. You always write a proper noun with a capital letter since the noun represents the name of a specific person, a place or a thing. So the names of days of the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday and so on, the months, January, February, March, etc. Historical documents like the Constitution of India or the Magna Carta, institutions like the Indian Institute of Technology, organizations like the United Nations or the World Health Organization, religions like Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, their holy texts like the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Bible and their adherents, Christians, Muslims, Hindus are all examples of proper nouns. A common noun is a noun referring to a person, a place or a thing in a general sense. So usually you should write it with a capital letter only when it begins a sentence. And this is true for any word. If the word is the first word in a sentence, you start it with a capital. The only time we use the first letter in capitals when it is not the first word of a sentence is if that particular word happens to be a proper noun. So a common noun in some sense can be considered to be the opposite of a proper noun. Abstract nouns are nouns which include actions, feelings, states and qualities. As the name itself suggests, these are not tangible things but rather things which are abstract in nature, which cannot be seen, rather which can only be felt. We can just feel about them or think about them. So for things like love, hate, fear, anger, respect, we say these are abstract nouns. Collective nouns refer to a single unit. For example, single word nouns like family, which is a group of relatives, army, a group of soldiers, jury, a group of people who pass decision upon a certain case. These are all examples of collective nouns. Collective nouns take the same type of persons or things and regard them as one unit or one entity. So different flowers together form a bouquet. Lots of fish but their entire group is singularly known as a school or a shoal of fish. Living entities take singular or plural verbs depending on their use in the sentence. But inanimate collective nouns take the singular verb only. So here's a basic tip on the usage of nouns. We use the articles a or an with singular countable nouns. So while it is the ocean, we say a boy or a pencil. We cannot use singular countable nouns alone. So it would be proper to say I went to see the drama but incorrect if you write I went to see drama. Similarly, a child was sitting on the stool is the correct usage. We cannot write 
child was sitting on the stool. In fact, for people who have been reading and writing in English for a long period of time, these incorrect sentences just sound incorrect. You can use the plural countable nouns alone. So we can say children sit on stools. We cannot normally use the articles a or an with uncountable nouns. So because things like sand or gases like helium are uncountable, we do not say a sand or a helium. But you can say a something of that particular item. For example, a bag of sand, a cylinder of helium and so on. We can use uncountable nouns alone. For example, you can say the worker added sand to the cement mixture and balloons are filled with helium. Now although here sand and helium do happen to be uncountable nouns, you can use them without the article. You can use some and any with plural countable nouns. So it would be proper to say she bought some pencils. Should we sell some cards? Are there any mangoes left over? Now here the nouns pencils, cards and mangoes are countable and hence it is proper to use words like some or any to define a small quantity. We use many and few with plural countable nouns. So if you take a look at these sentences, there were many children in the park. Here the noun children is countable and plural. So it is proper to use the word many before them. Similarly, I have a few marbles in my bag. Now marbles is again a plural and a countable noun. So it is proper to use the word few before it. You can also use some and any with uncountable nouns. In the two sentences given here, he bought some tea. Can you get some honey for me? Tea and honey are uncountable nouns. So we can use the word some before them. We use much and little with uncountable nouns. So the boys were looking a little off color. There wasn't much to do. So count nouns are used with a, an, the, many, few, fewer, number, this, that, each, every, either, neither, these, those, some, any, enough, a number of and so on. Non-countable nouns are used with words like much, less, lesser, this, that, some, any, enough, amount of. With regular practice you will quickly get a hang of which word can be used with what kind of noun. Some of the uncountable nouns are words like accommodation, permission, scenery, traffic, behavior, weather, work, information, travel, chaos, luck, bread, advice, baggage, damage and so on. Now before singular countable nouns we use the articles a or an. For example have a good day. Do you need an opinion? But you cannot use singular countable nouns alone. So we do not say he never uses pencil. We have to use the article a before the noun pencil and write it as he never uses a pencil. Similarly we do not say what wonderful day. The correct usage would be what a wonderful day. In some sentences we do use plural nouns alone and not with the word some. For example, koala bears are marsupials. Most of my friends are engineers. Ashwarya has green eyes. So here we do not use the article the and say Ashwarya has the green eyes. We simply say Ashwarya has green eyes. You can use some with plural countable nouns. Here some means a number of or a few of. So it would be correct to say I saw some good movies recently. Right? We do not say I have seen good movies recently. Similarly it is incorrect if you say I need new trousers. 
the proper usages, I need some new trousers. In fact, words like trousers, spectacles, jeans are always considered to be a pair of trousers or a pair of spectacles or a pair of jeans. My uncle is a chef. He writes cookbooks. Is the correct usage. You do not write, my uncle is a chef. He writes some cookbooks. We move on to the second part of speech and that is the pronoun. Now, we do not keep repeating a common noun or proper noun when referring to it in the same paragraph. We give the introduction using the proper or the common noun and then quickly switch it with a pronoun. So a pronoun is used instead of a noun to avoid repeating the noun again and again. For example, pronouns include words like I, you, he, she, it, we, they and so on. Given here is the pronoun chart. There are three persons. When you're talking about yourself and you're talking about yourself and you are the only subject, then we use the pronoun I or me. But when we are talking about someone and referring to that person when talking to the very same person, we refer to that person as you or your. When we are talking to a second person and referring to a third person who may or may not be present there, then if it is a male, we refer to the person as he or him or his. And if the third person happens to be a female, we use pronouns like she, her, hers, so on. If the third person or the third object that we are referring to is inanimate or has a neutral gender, then we use the pronouns it or its. Similarly, for the first person plural, we have pronouns like we, us, our, ours or ourselves. For the second person plural, we have pronouns like you, your, yours or yourselves. And for the third person plural, we have the common pronouns like they, them, their, theirs or themselves. The third part of speech is an adjective. An adjective is a word that describes a noun. It tells you something about the noun. It tells you something about the quality that the noun possesses. So we talk about degrees of comparison when we talk about adjectives. We have the positive degree. He is a clever boy. So here the word clever describes the quality of the boy. The comparative degree is when we are talking about a quality in comparison to a second object. So he is cleverer than his brother. The word cleverer describes his quality and says this quality is something which is in comparison with the same quality of the other person. Remember, when we are using the comparative degree, the objects of comparison must be the same. So we do not say the weather of Jaipur is better than Delhi because we cannot compare the weather of a city with another city. We would have to write the weather of Jaipur is better than the weather of Delhi or the weather of Jaipur is better than Delhi's. The superlative degree is used when we are saying that the quality possessed by the noun is the best. So he is the cleverest boy in the class. She is the prettiest girl in her dormitory and so on. Moving on to the second category of parts of speech, let's go on to those parts of speech which talk about an action. The verb is a word which describes an action that is doing something or a state being something. So words like talk, think, eat, drink, see, shake are all different types of verbs. A very basic thing that we need to understand is that in English if a sentence is grammatically correct and complete, it must possess a verb in it. It is impossible to give a grammatically correct and complete sentence in English and not have a verb in it. So even a one-lettered sentence like go, which is complete in itself, does contain the verb go. When we talk about verbs, we talk about the time in which they are occurring. So tenses refer to this. Any action takes place at a particular time 
and depending on what the time is, we use particular forms of verbs. So the three basic tenses include the past tense, that which has already happened, the present tense, that which is happening now, and the future tense, that which may occur in the future. The present tense expresses an unchanging, repeated or reoccurring action or situation that exists only now. It can also represent a widespread truth. So look at these sentences. The ocean is very deep. That's an unchanging action. Every year, new students join the school. This is a recurring action. Na is the chemical symbol for lead. And that's a widespread truth. Although, just as an aside, you should know that Na is not the chemical symbol for lead. Na or natrium is the chemical symbol for sodium. For lead, we have the symbol PB, which is plumbum. But coming back to our session on grammar. The past tense expresses an action or situation that was started and finished in the past. Most past tense verbs end in ED. The irregular verbs have special past tense forms which must be memorized. For example, World War II ended in 1945. So the verb end is regular and ends with ED. Valmiki wrote the Ramayana. The verb write is an irregular verb and hence the past form is not righted but wrote. The future tense expresses an action or situation that will occur in the future. This tense is formed by using words like will or shall with the simple form of the verb. For example, this song will get over in the next two minutes. The future tense can also be expressed by using the words am, is or are with going to. For example, the surgeon is going to perform the first bypass in January. Now, the present progressive tense or the continuous tense describes an ongoing action that is happening at the same time that the statement is written. So this tense is formed by using words like am, is or are with the verb form ending with ing. The present perfect tense describes an action that happened at an indefinite time in the past or that which began in the past and continues in the present. So this tense is formed by using words like has or have with the past participle of the verb. Now most past participles end in ed. Irregular verbs have special past participles that must be memorized. So for example, the students have traveled to many localities in order to collect more significant data. Here we have the verb have traveled. Women have voted in presidential elections since 1921. This action started in the past and continues in the present. So we have the present perfect tense of the verb and that is have voted. The past perfect tense describes an action that took place in the past before another past action. So this tense is formed by using the word had with the past participle of the verb. So by the time the troops arrived, the war had ended. The past action was the arrival of the troops and the war ended before that. So we use the past perfect tense had ended. The future perfect tense describes an action that will occur in the future before some other action. Now this tense is formed by using will have with the past participle of the verb. For example, by the time the troops arrive, the combat group will have spent several weeks waiting. The present perfect progressive tense or the present perfect continuous tense describes an action that began in the past, continues in the present and may continue into the future. So this tense is formed by using the words has or have been and the present participle of the verb that is the verb form ending with ing. So for example, the manager has been considering a transfer to the competitor's firm where profits would be larger. The past perfect progressive tense or the past perfect continuous tense describes a past ongoing action that was completed before some other past action. So this tense is formed 
by using had been and the present perfect of the verb that is the verb form ending in ing now before the budget cuts the company had been sponsoring many extracurricular activities the future perfect progressive tense describes a future ongoing action that will occur before some specified future time this tense is formed by using will have been and the present participle of the verb that is the verb form ending with ing so for example by the year 2020 linguists will have been studying and defining the indo-european language family for more than 200 years so here the future perfect continuous tense verb is will have been studying we move on to the next part of speech or the adverb now adverbs are words which modify a verb for example he drove how did he drive slowly or word that modifies an adjective he drove a very fast car what sort of a car was his how fast was it it was very fast or which modifies another adverb she moved quite slowly down the aisle how slowly did she move quite slowly so in these examples the words slowly very quite are all examples of adverbs an adverb often tells when where why or under what conditions something happens or happened adverbs frequently end with the words ly however many words and phrases not ending in ly also serve an adverbial function and an ly ending is not a guarantee that a word is an adverb so be careful for example words like lovely lonely motherly friendly neighborly are all examples of adjectives and not adverbs despite the fact they are all ending with ly next we move on to prepositions a preposition links nouns pronouns and phrases to other words in a sentence so the word or phrase that the preposition introduces is called the object of the preposition a preposition can often tell you the spatial location of an object so a preposition usually indicates the temporal spatial or logical relationship of its object to the rest of the sentence for example the book is on the table the book is beneath the table the book is leaning against the table the book is beside the table she held the book over the table she read the book during the class so it tells you the location with respect to space or time some of the most common prepositions used are about above across after against along among around at before behind below beneath beside between beyond but by despite down during except for from in inside into like near of off on onto out outside over past since through throughout till to towards under underneath until up upon with within and without a conjunction the next part of speech is something which joins two words phrases or sentences together so typical examples include words like and or but so because finally an interjection is an unusual kind of a word because it often stands alone interjections are words which express emotions or surprise and they are usually followed by the exclamation mark so examples include words like oh aha ouch hello hurrah and so on i hope this gave you a basic reminder of all the parts of speech that you would have studied at school we saw the eight parts of speech including the nouns pronouns adjectives verbs adverbs 
prepositions, conjunctions and interjections. Repeated practice will help us in solving questions on sentence correction and error spotting. There are a lot many rules to English grammar and more number of exceptions than there are rules. So repeated practice and a lot of reading is what is going to help you gain mastery over English grammar. My name is Satya Narayan. You just saw a session teaching you the basic parts of speech of English grammar. Wish you all the best. Have a good day.